investigation uh, is based on the culmination of a year's work with the Department of Justice that we had funded through the ESRC's Knowledge Exchange Awards Scheme. Now, what that meant was over the course of the year, we considered a range of issues linked to the Northern Ireland Executive's plan to remove all peace walls by 2023, as indicated in the TBUC strategy. In a sense, the problem of the peace walls can, can be seen as something that's been socially constructed. It wasn't considered a policy problem years ago when they were built. Rather, peace walls were seen as the solution to a different policy problem at that time. But since then, there's been a change in certain societal values with the peace process, which has since defined peace walls as a problem and thus attracts the attention of policymakers today. So we started with a statistic that was perhaps uncomfortable for those involved with the implementation of this policy priority. A survey that we'd conducted in 2012, just one year before the TBUC announcements, had indicated that 69% of those living closest to the peace walls believed that they needed to remain, at least for now, because of the potential for violence and disorder within their communities. Now, this statistic sat very uneasily with the executive's view that the removal of peace walls may, at least in a very normative sense, be seen as the ultimate act of reconciliation between two communities that had traditionally prioritised separation over sharing. From our perspective, though, the current framing of the policy through TBUC lagged far behind this sentiment and has been unable to convincingly answer the question of exactly why the peace walls should come down, particularly when that question is asked by those who live closest to the walls and who would prefer them to remain. So for us, this seemed to be the first problem that our policymakers faced, the problem of articulating a clearer rationale for why the walls needed to come down. But moving from the why question to the, uh, the much more fundamental question of what, we asked what was this policy actually trying to do? Now, it seemed very simple. When the policy, what the policy set out to do was remove all peace walls by 2023. But an interrogation of this very simple phrase revealed real problems for us. What did removal mean? Was a modification to a site or a structure the same thing as removal? What did all mean? How many is all? Do you have a list with all of the structures on it? And what exactly do you include when you use the term peace walls? Now, TBUC used the terminology of peace walls, interface barriers, and other structures of division very interchangeably. And for us, this was the second problem that policymakers faced, the problem of a lack of clarity in the phrase, the removal of all peace walls. So we spent some time thinking about this phrase as one of the most central tenets of the policy design, and it's clear that there needs to be, at least in government terms, an agreed definition of what a peace wall actually is. Is it anything that physically or otherwise has the effect of territorially dividing distinct communities? This is really important because the answer helps to calculate the total number of peace walls that the TBUC strategy seeks to target. And so this is the third problem that policymakers face. In the absence of any agreed definition of peace walls, which will, by extension, allow the policy objective to have a numeric value placed upon it, it's very likely that those who are tasked with policy implementation will, by necessity, have to work to their own interpretation of how many walls and barriers there are at present, and as such, this approach might not align with the original intentions that underpinned the TBUC strategy. So leaving that problem to one side, we thought about how many walls do people think that there actually are. Clearly, the truer answer to this question will depend on that agreed definition that we don't yet have. But some different stats are already out there. So the Belfast Interface Project's very important work uh, back in 2011-12 documented 99. David Cameron, in his address to this assembly a year later, mentioned the figure of 48. The Department of Justice, we know, have responsibility for 58. So this is the fourth problem that policymakers face, particularly those policymakers located within the Department of Justice. Are they responsible for the removal of all peace walls or only those that were erected by the statutory bodies? If it's the former and not the latter, how do they propose to deal with those structures that are owned by current landlords, private landlords, of which there are seven, and those whose ownership is not even known, of which there are four? 
So a review of how many walls there are actually necessitates a conversation about the current function of them. The West Link is an example of this. It's, it's one structure that actually is listed as a peace wall or an interface or a physical barrier of um, segregation and separation. And that may have been part of the original intention of it, but it's also a perimeter now to an eight-lane motorway. So a conversation has to take place around the current function of some of these structures. If its primary function is not safety and security related any longer, should its responsibility for its removal lie with the Department of Justice? So this might require some rethinking of what constitutes a peace wall and then by extension, who should be responsible for it. And for us, this was the final problem at the policy design phase. Now you don't give problems without giving solutions. So our suggestions for the TBUC program board um, that are constantly reviewing policy progress is, is, is this. It's clear that the TBUC strategy as it relates to the issue of peace walls needs some policy redesign though not necessarily any dramatic overhaul at this point. And this is because the roots of any policy success or failure can often be traced back to the design phase. We would suggest that the TBUC program board needs to rethink the language to give greater linguistic precision to the terminology used. What does the term removal of all peace walls really mean? We think that there needs to be a, a rethinking of the scale there may be a need for an agreed list of peace walls or structures which all of the stakeholders recognise. We can't have David Cameron quoting different stats from some of the statutory agencies. And we think that the TBUC programme board also need to rethink the issues of ownership. If the Department of Justice don't even own all of the structures, should they? If not, how can they lead others to deliver on this policy objective? Our view would be that successful policy implementation can only occur when policymakers have been clear about the nature of the problem. In its simplest form, the government strategy suggests that peace walls are the problem and that removal is the solution. However, for 69% of those that live, is, live in closest proximity to the walls, the potential for violence is the problem and the maintenance of the peace walls, at least for now, is the policy solution. Reconciling these positions needs to begin at the design stage. However, with TBUC, we're already at the implementation stage. And so Duncan will talk through some of the issues that we identified at this point. The TBUC strategy identifies um, a fairly uh, ambitious target, which is to reduce and remove by 2023 all interface barriers. And it's underpinned by the stated key objective, that's the term, to have no interface barriers by 2023. So the scale of the ambition is clear and the year is also clear. So it's um, within eight years. There is also an articulated fairly strong um, design structure, a ministerial panel with all ministers from the executive and representatives of other key bodies. And the goal is to ensure the full and active participation of all relevant departments and to hold ministers and agencies accountable for the actions and targets in their areas of responsibility. The coordination of uh, this is through an interagency group designed to create a more strategic approach on how interventions are designed and resources are allocated and to coordinate the work while reporting to the Ministerial Panel on Progress. The uh, DOJ uh, is the lead department because of the historic ownership, as Cathy has outlined. But actually, as soon as you uh, start looking at these issues, the interagency group becomes incredibly complex and currently includes representatives of OFM, DFM, DSD, the Department of Employment and Learning, DRD, Department of Education, Health, Social Services and Public Safety, the Police Service, Housing Executive, Belfast City Council, Community Relations Council and the International Fund for Ireland. And there's an interface community partners group along with that too. So, Essentially, at one level, there's a very clear target and there's an extremely complex delivery structure. There's also a promise of an interface barrier support package, but of unspecified size, which is designed to produce uh, funding for community capital projects, employing community interface workers, create funding resources for a community forum at every interface to ensure implementation and monitoring and to establish a capital improvement package to change and improve the barrier while developing a phased opening strategy. 
So the promise of, um, of resources at one level appears to be fairly clear. One of the difficulties has been that the, uh, most of those resources to date seems to have been generated either from resources which were already uh, voted or from international support, potentially from the Peace Forward programme, but also the IFI Peace Walls programme, which, had dis which started in January 2012, so therefore uh, a year and 18 months before TBUC, and had invested resources on its basis in eight projects in Belfast and Derry, Londonderry. So the effect of the target, the first question, what effect has the declaration of a specific target had, has been complex. For some people, it has set a useful goal in the future. For other people, it appeared to arrive after their own goals, which may have been shorter, were already in place. So a degree of confusion on the ground we picked up about what does it mean in the interim. Perhaps most importantly is that the statement of a long uh, the, perhaps one of the biggest gaps we identified was that the statement of a long target over 10 years, which exceeds the life of any given assembly by some amount, uh, does not allow you to create a series of specific milestones. And two years into the programme, the absence of uh, um, milestones seems to be almost um, uh, as important as the importance of the aims and vision. The uh, responsibilities um, of the lead department um, is, are also complex because whereas in the erection of walls and barriers a security as imperative was identified, as soon as you start talking about removing barriers around which huge amounts of things have grown, the issues of economic regeneration, community development, cultural pluralism and infrastructural investment arise which are clearly outside the barriers of a justice department. And so the development of swift and flexible response from a variety of responsible agencies around budgets seems to me to be critical in the develop for us to be critical in any uh, attempt to successfully deliver the target. The scale of the barrier support programme remains unknown, and given the scale of what is to be supported, capital projects, uh, um, forums and so on, it would be important two years into the programme to identify exactly how much uh, resources may be available, because that could have an important effect in shaping opportunities and expectations. Um, the, sorry, that didn't move. I'm sorry if I um, moved first. The, um, the benefits of the 2023 target, as I've said, for some seem to have, are, 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 prob are in some ways problematic. Part of the difficulty is that many of the benefits appear to be regional, whereas articulating local benefits to people in the community consent context has been much more difficult. And it's going to be very important to move from articulating regional benefits to also articulating local benefits and actually working out how those two are connected. Um, how does the uncertainty in the Northern Ireland Executive affect the delivery? have to be said that over the last two years there has been a sense in the ground that we've picked up in all of our qualitative work, interviewing people at local level in the groups, that, there's, that the uncertainty at strategic level has been matched by growing tension in inter-community relations at local level, and that creates a serious obstacles in terms of the viability of the overall target as we move forward. And so keeping strategic focus at the ministerial panel and making clear that this is part of a delivery target um, and will impact on the delivery target seems to be us to be an important political matter. Perhaps most importantly is the role of local representatives of executive parties. Um, it appears as though while this has clearly been endorsed as a strategy at strategic level, the role for local representatives of parties is less clear and the role in advocacy or the role in actually developing the policy and is seeing it as a policy which is supported by local representatives is at times unclear and uncertain and the specific role for, for and what the role of local advocates is uh, seems to be critical to articulate at this stage. The responsibilities of residents, community leaders and interface projects in delivering the TBUC target and how they are to be engaged. This project um, promises to deliver change with community consent. What becomes clear as soon as we look at the implementation of this is that both community and consent are issues which are not defined, and these will be taken up in the last part of the presentation. Our research suggests that the current delivery structure should be reviewed as a matter of priority to ensure that roles and responsibilities of all partners are clear and to confirm that they are capable of delivering the Peace Walls targets set out in TBUC for 2023.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly just on the, the final part of the presentation, which is the third policy brief, which relates to the challenge of engaging communities. Because in terms of the TVOC strategy relating to Peace Walls, underpinning the executive's approach to dismantling the physical barriers is the importance of community. And this extract from the TVOC strategy here um, underpins that and sort of highlights the, the context of community, where it talks about taking down barriers is not something that can be achieved without the consent and support of people who live there, acknowledging the sensitivities of it, the perceptions of residents, uh, and about creating the conditions with which division and segregation can become resigned to the past. So it's very clear that the executive highlights this. So in terms of the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk about this extract in the context of community confidence, in terms of community consent and community consultation, and uh, put forward some evidence-based observations that the research team have made in relation to this. Since it was launched and the focus shifted to Peace Walls, the language and the rhetoric from the executive, from politicians, recognises the importance of community confidence in any decision-making process. But there's a failure to articulate how this should be expressed or achieved. Essentially, there's an absence of understanding around what constitutes community confidence, and more importantly, how do you know when it has been reached? We have no benchmark. Confidence is not stationary. It fluctuates on a daily and weekly and annual basis. It's not generic, and it's not consistent. And one thing we've realised very quickly is that across Belfast, for example, there are different nuances and contexts that exist within communities that have peace walls. There are some more advanced than others in terms of having the conversation around physical structures. But yet, this is very generic in terms of the language around confidence. Um, confidence, more than others, is, uh, is challenging in terms of the clarity around the issue of peace walls has become entangled with wider societal challenges, such as legacy of the past, expressions of culture and commemoration, and building a shared society. So essentially, what we're articulating is that macro-political issues have an effect at a grassroots level in terms of peace walls. So, for example, um, when the flag protests um, began, when we had issues around um, legacy issues, sometimes you find that, that at peace walls and within communities that have physical barriers, there's a manifestations of anger and frustration that are expressed around those walls and barriers. So when you're, conver you're having conversations around the physical structures, the reality is, is that they have the conversations around the walls has become entangled with wider societal pressures. Because we have very little visible aesthetics of the conflict left in Northern Ireland. So the peace walls or conflict architecture, as other people refer to, are one of the last visible manifestations of the conflict. So they find that they can be manipulated and this is where the pressures actually take place. So you could be having conversations around the wall, but actually it's about wider societal issues that are being played out within the wall. So the question remains from a policy perspective as to what is required at a local and a unique local level to build and maintain confidence in any process aimed at removing the peace walls. The second area is community consent, and a key tenant of the executive's approach to re removing all the peace walls is the assurance that decisions will only be taken with the consent and support of those that live there. Although this is well-meaning, it raises significant challenges for those tasked with implementing this policy. What exactly does community consent equate to? Is it a majority? Is it over 50%? Is it everybody within that community? Who should and should not be included within any, any process attempting to ascertain levels of consent? And finally, should there be a hierarchy of consent? In other words, should those that maybe live right beside a peace wall have more right in terms of the decision-making process than those that live 10 feet away, 20 feet away, 30 feet away? These are really, really significant questions that haven't been answered. So in the absence of clarity, it raises the potential for the emergence of vetoes and also allows people to question the legitimacy of any consent process. And in Northern Ireland, throughout the conflict, where individuals and gatekeepers and um, malign ele elements sometimes have an opportunity to have a platform and an audience, it's likewise, in the terms of the Peace Walls conversation, this creates the opportunity for vetoes. Finally, we come to the consultation. There's a clear emphasis in the strategy that residents must have the opportunity to participate and contribute within any process. The strategy talks about consultation, but fails to provide any details as to what this means. So, for example, what are we actually asking people to decide on? What is the vision in the absence of a peace wall? We talk about the removal of peace walls, but what are we actually replacing it with? You know, we have a tendency in, in, at the, in Northern Ireland sometimes to offer the negative as the vision as opposed to the positive. You know, this is what we have, and this is what we don't have. And so, likewise, in the terms of the peace walls, what are we actually asking people, you know, we're taking the wall down, but what will change by taking the wall down? 
How should we engage and consult with communities? You know, what does legitimacy look like in the terms of consultation? And how do we ensure that they have the required information and knowledge to make decisions? We're asking local people within particularly marginalised communities to make very significant, significant decisions about their safety and around the, 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 the built environment. And as Duncan articulated earlier, sometimes we, the benefits of this are regional as opposed to local. So we need to ensure that those who are making these decisions are suitably informed. So the ambiguity and around consultation simply adds to the challenges around implementing this policy. Finally, our work recognises the importance of community, but argues that there is also no understanding or direction about how the community positively can contribute within the overall policy process. There is still ambiguity and lack of clarity around this specific point. Our work would suggest that the Northern Ireland Executive may wish to revisit and reassess its commitment to meet the 2023 target. Furthermore, the Executive should consider an official model of consultation that is both flexible but robust and has been endorsed by all of the parties in the Executive. This gives it legitimacy in terms of what it's trying to achieve. Secondly, underpinning the strategy is the need for community confidence in, in the process. Therefore, the Executive should develop a series of indicators to ascertain the specific relationships between confidence and the removal of peace walls focusing on the social, the political, the economic and the cultural variables that exist within communities. So in other words, you may be having a conversation, as, I, as I've articulated earlier, about a physical structure and a peace wall, but macro-political issues, whether it's about the executive, whether it's about flags, whether it's about parades, whether it's about legacy, may actually have a direct influence on in how you view the future of that peace wall. So we need to look at that in terms of what does that mean in confidence building measures. And finally, we need a clear and definitive answer as to what community consent means. Without the risk of this, we run the risk essentially of encouraging vetoes and limiting progression on what is a complex and emotive issue. And finally, um, Mike talked about at the beginning there around this idea around devolving policy from the central, and, and I think that makes perfect sense, and I think that's, a, that's an appropriate way to move forward. But if you don't back that up with resources, if you don't back that up with commitment, if you don't back that up with stable government, and if you don't back that up with the tools and the mechanics to do it, then it can be looked like an abdication of responsibility. And I think sometimes that that's where, we're, where we are. There's, a, uh, there's an onus to push the pressure back down to the micro without giving it the support at the macro in which it needs. Thank you.